Hey guys, so this is a Q&A video. I'm going to be answering numerous questions from patrons of mine who donate $5 or more. Um, what I'm gonna do in the pinned comment in the comment section below will be the list of all the questions uh, submitted by my patrons uh, who donate $5 or more and a link to the Patreon page. So if you guys want to ask more questions uh, in the future that I can answer in and you know next month's Q&A video, please become a patron and support the channel. I will also timestamp the video for those specific questions. So you can, if you go to the pin comment, you can jump around and so on. So without further ado, first question. I'm probably gonna butcher names here, but never mind. Seraphim asks, what do you think about the Treaty of Versailles in relation with the start of World War II? Okay, I, I think this question is a big question, and I think it's probably going to deserve at least a video on its own. I've actually studied the Treaty of Versailles, I did it in college, um, school, no, sorry, is it high school, college, university in Britain, just want to point that out. Um, I've actually, I've studied it, and it's a very complicated subject, and there's no real way I can do that in this video. So, what I will say is that there is numerous debates about this, whether the treaty was harsh or not very harsh, um, whether it led to the rise of Hitler or whether that was just a thing. It, like, there's so much, so many factors in this. Um, in relation to World War II, I definitely think it was a factor um, because what the Treaty of Versailles did, I mean, it's not the only factor, certainly not the only factor, but um, the end of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles and all the things that are going on in the world at that point these are all factors that lead to economic instability and then the political instability uh, in the interwar period, which then leads to the rise of Hitler. So Hitler is very much only able to rise because of what happens in that interwar period. It's like a specific set of circumstances, really. It, he's kind of like, I, I think he's, he's not going to rise in a world where everything is stable. He's only able to rise because of the instability. And the Treaty of Versailles definitely leads to that level of instability. Um, it definitely plays a factor in, let's say, the Rhineland crisis, where you that leads to hyperinflation. So basically, to put it bluntly, uh, put it very shortly, because I've only got a limited amount of time in this video, uh, the, the the French go into the Rhineland because Germany can't pay her reparations from the Treaty of Versailles. So as a result of that, the German government has to pay the workers in the Rhineland who go on strike. And there's a whole th there's a whole thing about this. But basically, that then leads to hyperinflation, where money is just worthless, uh, and then that leads to bartering and so on. And it's a very complicated topic. But basically, then that leads to more problems going forward. So. Yeah, definitely economic and then political instability as a result of that. So, yeah, def it definitely is a factor. Was it the main factor? I don't really know at this point in time. I would argue it's a major factor, though. So there is that. So, yeah, I, I, what I'll say is that I've answered it kind of in this question, uh, in this Q&A video, but I will at some point do another video and I will make it much more in depth than this. I think that's probably the best way to say, you know, I'll do it. Alex asks, what is your opinion on the widely held belief that one of the main reasons for Germany's defeat was the failure to fully mobilize until 1944? Is this just more playing the blame game by the German generals in their memoirs, or is there some sort of merit to this view? Mobilization, the Germans only mobilized the total war economy um, really in late 1942. It's actually because of the Battle of Stalingrad. This is why Stalingrad is important. Um, I don't think it was really possible beforehand. Like people make the argument, oh, if they mobilized earlier, it would have been better somehow. But in, given the context, they can't really mobilize before Stalingrad. Stalingrad is the catalyst for the change. And it's, it's the excuse given. Prior to this, though, um, what you have to understand is that Germany wanted to win the war very, very quickly. They couldn't really... Hitler was reluctant to mobilise because he had seen what had happened in the First World War and felt this uh, stab-in-the-back policy. So he wasn't really 
willing to mobilize fully because he thought that would bring down morale which would then lead to the the crisis in in the rear so he couldn't really he didn't feel right to do that until stalingrad had happened but what's interesting what i think is interesting is that you know the, the total mobilization thing that happened in 1943 really by the time it gets going it, you know it leads to more women in the workforce and so on and so forth but the, the manpower crisis for Germany by this point, I mean, there was already that. This is people think that the manpower crisis for Germans only happened in like 1943 ish. Okay, no, it was a fact beforehand, um, and I've said this before in videos. Like you know, Germany had the most manpower in 1943, which is true. They had the most um, troops in the field in 1943 at the Battle of Kursk. They also had the most tanks. In December of 1942, uh, six no 7,500 something like that. So that is when they peak. Not 1944, they peak then. And while they do have the most troops, and I've said this, you know, 1941, 1942, 1943, they have the most troops. They have the most tanks. The, the tanks are growing. The troops are growing. You know, there's dips and dives, but but they are growing. It's going up, and it's post curse that the the dip happens. But the manpower was an issue before, just more so for the economy, not necessarily for the the troops. What you have to remember is that in 1941 prior to barbarossa the germans have to i forget which year it is i think it's 1922 they have to drag in the the class of 1922 let's say i think it's 19, whatever the 18 year olds were or, you know they have to drag them in early a year early in order to have enough troops for barbarossa they have to do the same for 1942 they have to drag in the class of 1940 uh, 1923 or, or whatever whatever those years were i'm not sure the exact dates but they have to drag in the people early in order to have enough manpower to do it. So there is a manpower crisis going on, but it's false to say that they didn't have enough troops. Um, and it's false to say they didn't have enough numbers. I mean, they have at some point 6 million workers, foreign workers in Germany alone. And this is where, you know, people say, oh, well, they didn't commit atrocities in the East and stuff. It's like, well, where do these foreign workers come from? They came from the East. They dragged them in and then they starved them to death, which probably wasn't a good idea uh, because they needed it. So Germany really, I mean, Germany peaks in manpower in 1942-1943, peaks in production in terms of the number of tanks they have in the field in 1942-43. But what's interesting is that the Germans go east in 1941 with 3,900 Panzers-ish, but they actually had over 6,000 in stock. They just didn't send them east because they couldn't. The oil crisis, they can't do it. So actually, I mean, they could have built better tanks, but they couldn't really, you know, if they'd gone total war economy in 1941 or 1942, you know, earlier, then... I mean, what difference would it have made, really? They already, they're already scraping the barrel at this point, so they've already kind of mostly total war economized anyway. And then at the same time, you've also got the fact that they, they're not sending all their tanks east anyway, because they can't, because of the oil crisis. So, yeah, they could have made better tanks. They could have replaced all the tanks they had with Mark, Mark 3s and 4s. That would have been great. But they, beyond that, they couldn't really do a lot more because of the oil crisis. So... To say that they should have mobilized earlier, it, it's not a true reflection of the reality of what's happening in the field. It just doesn't, you can't, they can't really do it. They can't really do it. And as I say, Hitler is very reluctant to do this because if he does mobilize early, it's, he's scared of what will happen because of the First World War. So given the context... I don't think it's a valid argument to say that they should have mobilized earlier. I, I, I don't, I don't think they could have done it prior to Stalingrad. So, if there had been a Stalingrad in 1941, maybe. But I, I, it, I mean, by this point anyway, it's too. It's kind of I don't know. I, I just feel like to say that it, it's not really taking into fact the political and economic aspects that's going on. So yeah, this idea that the mobilization should have happened earlier, it doesn't It doesn't work in the reality of the time. Craig asks, what made the Sturmgeschütz the so-called war-winning tank in terms of the individual engagements? 
I've always found it bizarre that during the defensive phase of the Eastern Front why an assault gun was considered such an enormous advantage. I've always viewed the function of a Stug as an infantry support tank or urban fortress buster. So this is actually one of my favourite vehicles of the Second World War, the Sturmgeschütz. Um, but just to clarify, it's not actually a tank, it's actually an assault gun or, an, you know, you can say it's an armoured fighting vehicle, but it's not a tank because it doesn't have a turret. A, a tank requires a turret in order for it to be classed as a tank. So this is more of a uh, assault gun. And when I went to Tank Fest last week, um, I actually saw a Stug, which is the first Stug I've ever seen. Um, and this is actually a Finnish Stug and it's got um, wood on the sides as extra armour plating. Um, there's a few factors I th I'd say that go into making this a good design. Um, it, first off, it's based on the chassis of the Panzer III. So you've already got a very good tank body um, that you can then use as, as a, another vehicle. So you don't have to do redesign, you don't have to design this thing from scratch. It's not like, you know, you have to redesign the tank like a Panther or a Tiger. You've already got a working model that's actually going to, you know, we, you know it's effective and it's actually just there. You just need to remodel the, the thing. Um, it's also, because it's a Panzer III chassis, it's also quite cheap. And then they can produce a lot of these, which they do in the Eastern Front. They have tons of these. There's actually, at one point, more Stug 3s than any other fighting vehicle on the Eastern Front, I believe. I think I heard that in a documentary. So that might not be true, but I, I assume that is still the case. <laughs> they also, because they don't have a turret, um, they have a lower profile. So when you're talking about defense, this is good. In fact, the Stug, if you compare it to even the, you know, next to the Stug in the, in the tank fest was the M3 light tank, the Stuart or the Honey. And, and the, the difference of height is massive. A Stug could hide behind a bush, you know, a Stug could hide behind a, a fence. Um, these things were very low. That meant that they were easier. Um, to hide. It also meant they were good at ambushing and it meant that they're not as easy to hit as a larger vehicle like a tank would be. Um, and because of this, it also means they have a lower weight, which means that they can carry a bigger gun. And this is a major factor because a gun which is bigger. So a Panzer III can't really have a 75 millimeter gun on it, but a Stug can, because you get rid of the turret, you can put a bigger gun in it. So this means that this tank or vehicle now has the capability of taking out bigger targets at, and it's cheaper overall. It's like a, it's a win-win situation, really. Um, the Stugs originally had a short barreled 75 millimeter gun, but these were good at taking out targets like buildings in Stalingrad, for example, that we use quite effectively in Stalingrad. And they were also good at taking up bunkers. Um, they were good at infantry support and later on, especially anti-tank because you got the long barreled uh, 75, they could take out uh, armored vehicles. So, you know, if you compare a Panzer III to a Stug with a long barrel, um, you know, you've, you've got an armored fighting vehicle, which is more capable of destroying enemy tanks and, you know, as well as other obstacles than the Panzer III. So it's a, it's a very good investment for, well, I mean, it's, it's generally cheaper or the same price. You know, I, I don't know the exact Reichsmarks, but it's, it's without the turret. So you, it's, it's simpler design. It also means they've got, um, it's got heavy, it can be heavier armored and the, the, Panzer III chassis at the front of the Stug is actually very heavily armoured for its time. So again, there's so many benefits to doing this. So really, it's, it, it is a combination of different factors that make it really good. And it, yeah, you could say the Stug is very, very good at defence and okay on the offence because, you know, it's not going to tour it. It's, it makes it a bit difficult for the offensive, but it's good at infantry, infantry support. So there is that factor. And obviously in builds of areas like Stalingrad, very, very useful machine. So yeah, there's definitely a bunch of you know, a bunch of factors here. What the main one is, it's up to you to decide. But I I think that explains why it was a good design. Was it a war-winning tank? Probably not, because it didn't win the war. Uh, but it's definitely an effective vehicle, and it prolonged the life of the Panzer III 
chassis, I guess, um, which is good for the economy and the total war that Germany then faced itself in later in the war. So, yeah. There's also a few questions by several of you that are all related, so I'm going to answer all these together. So Craig also asks, are you ever planning to cover Imperial Japan? And any plans to cover the naval warfare? Afflicted also said, uh, kind of a general question for the channel, I'm not sure if it's appropriate specifically for here, but as a US Marine, I'm also very interested in the Pacific Island Hopping Campaign. So can I cover Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and Guadalcanal? And then Jen Ari Asher... I hope I said that right. Um, it's a Star Wars reference. Uh, it's also said, it's, you've got a few questions here, but number one, I've seen that you used to upload quite a few videos about historical topics that aren't the Second World War. Is there anything specific that has caused the shift to go from history in general to the Second World War specifically? I think this is one of those lessons that I've learned and I want to apply and this is this is why. So the lesson that I've learned is that I want to specialize. I think it's very important for anyone who wants to be get good at anything, they've got to specialize in it. So for example, if you know, but basically you are what you produce. So if you produce really good guitar riffs on a guitar, then you become a very good guitarist, like over and over and over. You know, if you do something over and over again, you'll you'll get good at it. If you are, and I just want to point out, I will do that guitar video because it got 100 likes that comment. So, uh, but yeah, if, if you if you want to get really good at something, you do it over and over again until you get good at it. And it, it's the same with jobs. Um, you are what you produce. If you produce a lot of wheat, you're a farmer. And, you know, and if you take that wheat and and produce a lot of bread, then you are a baker and, and so on. And if you produce profit, you're a shopkeeper or a retail worker or whatever. So the, the, you, you are what you produce. Okay. That's how our society, whether it's right or wrong, that's how our society values an individual, you know, and, and you become that. So if you produce a lot of bread, you become the baker. You know, that is that you're assigned a role, you're assigned a title. So in a sense, the reason why I don't want, well, I say I don't want, the reason why I not, Doing those other topics is because I am specializing on particular topics. So, for example, my my sort of I like the whole of history. Like I've got books on Julius Caesar and whatever else. I like the whole of history. I'm really interested in it in general. But I am specifically interested in the period from 1850s to 1950s. Okay, and then more specifically, I'm more interested in the uh, 1914 ish, uh, you know, maybe, maybe slightly before then consequences going into the first world war. And then up until maybe just after the second world war, that sort of period is my sort of speciality. So world war one into war period, world war two, and then the before and the, and the after, but only in relation to that period. So that is my sort of specialization. Then more specifically, I'm into World War II, um, because that's what I really, really enjoy most. In that, I'm also interested in the European conflict, more especially, because I think this is where I am biased, because I'm European. So I'm more interested in that, because that's what I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more relevant, I guess, is the thing. So I, I'm more interested in the European conflict, but then I'm also more interested in the land warfare, because I feel like that's the most important aspect. It's not it's not because the others aren't important. I don't want anyone to come away and think, oh, the air war. And like, no, it is important. It's just, I'm more interested in the land war because I think it's the most important. That's, you know, it's one of those things. But then going beyond that, I am I was really interested in Market Garden just because of the game Close Combat British Too Far. But then beyond that, I'm interested in Normandy uh, and what happens in France in both 1940 and 1944. And I'm also interested in the Eastern Front, obviously, especially Stalingrad, and of course, um, North Africa. But I am really, really, really honing in on, at the minute, especially North Africa and Stalingrad. That's like, and sort of 1942, that's the kind of thing I'm honing in on. But obviously to do that, I obviously need to know what came before and then after and, and, and like Barbarossa and whatever else. So there is that. But it's generally the period 1941 to 1942. That's really my speciality. And then Mark Gunn. <laughs> Mark Gunn's like the extra child. And maybe Fort Ebenemel uh, and so on. So 
yeah, that I feel like I should specialize because if you specialize, you become good at it. This is the reason why I've got a ton of books on Stalingrad. Okay, so, it, it, you know, if, if you want to know about Stalingrad, I've probably got the answer for you, or I can tell you where you can get the answer for you, um, or I can lead you in the right direction at least, or gives you, you know, give you some pointers because how many people have got this many books on their shelves about Stalingrad and have read them? Not very many. So, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those things. It's like, I've specialized on enough that if you want to know, you know, certainly on YouTube, if you want to know something about Stalingrad, I'm your guy kind of thing. So that's the reason why. And because of, you know, all this in-depthness and all the details and whatever else, I can give you specific sort of, aha, this is, this is something you didn't know about, or, hey, everyone thinks it's this thing, but it's actually this thing, because, because you dive into those details, you get it. Like the, the, the Tuprani thing. I wouldn't have found out about Tuprani if I hadn't have focused on the Eastern Front. So I wouldn't have been able to make the oil video. You know, and Hayward is there as well, and that's again Stalingrad and uh, Fritz with Oust Creek. They all mention the oil crisis, and it's like without all of this, without me specifically going for Stalingrad on the Eastern Front, I wouldn't have been able to come up to this conclusion and then thus make that video. So that's this is why specialization is important. So it's not that I'm not interested in the air war or the naval war. I am. I'm just not able to kind of focus on it. That's the difference. Now, I am actually interested. I wasn't really interested in the air war, the naval war too much. And that's why I've gone for the land war. But I am now. After Bruneville, the Bruneville raid video, I have developed an interest in the air war. I'm now like, oh, that's interesting. So I now want to study it. Same with the oil video. Because I did the oil video, I now have an interest in the British blockade because that is important, because it stops the Germans from getting oil, thus, you know, and so on. So that's now something I'm interested in. Um, but that's, you know, I can't really focus on them at the minute until after Stalingrad. Same applies to the, the Japanese and the, and the Pacific area. I do have a book or two on Burma, and I would like to, to cover the island hopping campaigns, but the reason I can't is because in order for me to do that, I would have to, with any of these topics, I would have to sit down and read, 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 read for like six months at least just to get the context in order for me to go and do it because my speciality or my my focus has always been the European land war in, in uh, Europe. No, I said Asia then. Don't start with land war in Asia. Um, you know, that, that's my special focus. So in order to then take that and go to the Japanese from, it, like I know some of the tanks, obviously I know the weapons, I know whatever, but I don't know the events. I don't know um, the events in China with the Japanese or Manchuria or, or, or whatever. I don't actually know, so I'd have to study it, and thus that would take so long that it's not, especially right now, it's not worth me doing that. So that, I mean, I, I might do one day, but it's going to be after Stalingrad because my focus is, at the minute, specifically on those events. In terms of the historical topics, uh, I think you're referring to things like revisionist historian and um, critical thinking and so on. I do want to go back to them. In fact, I've been meaning to make more videos on that sort of topic. And the reason I can cover them and I want to cover more of them is because they are general history. Like I don't need to do a ton of research for that because I'm kind of already doing it. Like you know, um, Simon, Simon Baker, I keep mentioning him every so often. He, he's a, a tutor, a teacher in Australia. He's all, on, on to me all the time on Twitter. Not all the time, but I'm going to emphasize it. He's on to me all the time saying, can you make more videos that I can use for my classes? I can show people how to do history. Like, show me how to revise. Show me how to do studying and show me how you do note taking and how you create your video. He wants me to make that sort of stuff because it's valuable to the, the students. And a lot of students out there probably are going, how does Tick do 372,000 words of research for Stalingrad? So there are people who are out there who want to know this, and I can probably give you that information. Um, and I do intend to do it at some point. But, as I say, it's, it's just not... The priority has always just been the specific 
battles, you know, Crusader at the minute and then Stalingrad and then Kurland and a few others. So that is the reason why I'm not doing those other topics because I, I have specialized in it. And I think anyone out there who's interested in Japan and all that other stuff, you need to find, if there isn't a YouTube out there, then make one. <laughs> you need to find somebody who can specialize in on the east, uh, the Far Eastern Front and go for it. So if you are thinking of making a YouTube channel and you want to cover something, cover something that maybe me or Military History Visualize or Chieftain or whoever haven't covered and go for it and specialize in it. Because if you do that, you will break away from the mold, right? If there is a YouTuber who covers Japan, then I don't have to cover it. <laughs> um, but also it complements, we complement each other. I can go, go, if you want to see Japan, go to that guy. So yeah, I think, I think people should specialize. It's the, it's the way you get good at something. So yeah, I hope that, hopefully that answers those questions. Jen also asks, you've talked a lot about the issues facing the Red Army during 1941 and 42. A truly awful organization of the army, that overburdening commanders, bad morale and discipline. The fact that the Red Army was in the middle of mobilization when Germany attacked. The fact that Germany had essentially had a head start in growing their army, etc. Do you think that these factors alone explain the huge Soviet losses? One thing I've noticed is that the Soviets seem to, quite consistently, suffer a lot of losses due to disease. However, this is not something that seems to get mentioned a lot in the books. Maybe that helps explain just why the casualties were so enormously different, even during some of the Red Army's greatest triumphs like Bagration or Uranus. Germany definitely mobilized earlier, and I do think that is what gave... Germany, the initial advantage in the 1939, 1940, 1941 period, and really kind of extends into 1942, although we really shouldn't have done by that point. Um, that is the reason why, because, you know, sh sh Germany has mobilized, they've got more troops than the Soviets do in 1941, blah, 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 and, and they have a lot more tanks there. The tanks they do have have got better guns, the, the 50 millimeter. The British were using a two pounder. A two pounder, which is like a, I think it's, uh, 30 or 40 millimeter. The Germans are using 50 millimeters and their Panzer threes. They've got better guns. They just have. And they've got better tanks in general because they mobilized earlier. And it's the same with the Russians, the mo, of the Soviets. The most of the tanks that the Soviets have are, well, most of the tanks are T26s. Um, <laughs> half of the, at least 10,500 are T26s. So, yeah, to say that the Germans have got the initial advantage because they mobilized earlier, that is definitely right. Um, but I think one of the more... In, in also, at the same time, the Soviets haven't mobilized as well. They are kind of mobilizing in 1941. Well, they are mobilizing in 1941. And that is also a factor because what happens is the, the Soviets are mobilizing. They're also reorganizing. And there's a lot of factors into this. I think I mentioned this before. But essentially... The, the way they do it, they kind of mess it up because they're in the middle of this mobilization. So Germany really hits them at the right time. But the factor that I wanted to point out is the support services for the, the Red Army are not finished. They're not prepared. The Soviet, the Soviets can't, um, the Soviet Red Army is not prepared in 1941 at all. The troops are not prepared and neither are the support services. You've got, um, tank, divisions that go into the battles without their guns being bored um, or uh, you haven't got enough ammunition or you've not got enough fuel or they break down and there's no mechanics and there's no logistical services the, the whole the whole thing is completely gone the um, rifle units in the tank divisions for the Soviets do not have trucks so that means they can't pull their artillery they can't pull the um, well, they can't bring their infantry to the to the fight, which means they've got a lack of infantry and artillery as these lovely T-26s and so on and so forth just kind of ride off and get wiped out by the Germans. So there is this issue. And then you've got the medical services. Now, I have read, you probably won't be able to see it up here, but I've got uh, Stumbling Colossus and Colossus Reborn by David Glanz, which is probably the two books that are most focused on the Red Army in this period, prior to the war and then in the war. And I've, I've looked through it prior to this and I've, I'm, I'm like, yep, they don't even mention it. Don't even mention the medical services of the Red Army. And 
none of my books do. None of the books that I have I mention, or you know, they kind of maybe hint at it, but they, they don't actually go into detail with it. And it's been, you know, you've mentioned the disease factor, and I don't know the specifics of that, that. I don't know if it is a major factor or not, but here's the deal. I have often suspected that the Red Army suffered more casualties because they they weren't prepared to fight, which meant they didn't have the medical facilities to recover their losses. So with the Germans, um, in fact, I was reading Island of Fire the other day, uh, and in that, that, one of the first pages, it says, a guy is fighting in Stalingrad, he gets shot, his jaw breaks, and he is carted off, and there's medical, and they, and they have, I think it's like second day, he's got surgery, and blah, blah, blah. Is that going to be the case with the Soviets in Stalingrad? Probably not. I don't think there was as many or as much. So it is a, I think it is a factor. It's a major factor. But unfortunately, no one's really mentioned it. No one's really, and this is one of those things where if you have, if you have, if you somebody out there who has a book or sources that do mention the medical side of, of the Red Army, let me know because I suspect that the trickle back factor is not there. It just isn't. I, I, well, I don't think it's as good. I don't think it's as good as the Germans. So it, let's say the both sides take 10 losses each. You know, the Germans, five, six, seven of them might return to the front, whereas the, the Soviets, like, one or two, you know, and that's where you've got the, the issue. I think that is also, is a definite factor, but I have no zero, um, real sort of facts about it. Um, I did look up that the price of victory said that 1.2 million men in the Red Army died from their wounds in the hospitals alone. 1.2 million. So that is a massive factor. Um, but again, I don't know the specifics. And yeah, I mean, 1.2. So people were complaining last video that 158,000 Red Army soldiers were uh, shot by their own men over the course of the war. And it's like, oh, it's such a big number. 1.2 million died in hospital. It's a big factor. And that's just those who got to the hospital. Does, does that necessarily mean it was wounded on the front who died later? Like, I don't, I don't know the specifics, but this is what I mean. I think there needs to be a study if there hasn't been one already, because I suspect that this is a big factor and it's been completely ignored by the historiography. Jen also says, this is a bit of a personal question. Everywhere I look, I either see people insisting that Rommel was one of the greatest commanders to ever live or a moron who didn't understand the concept of supplies. As far as I'm concerned, both of these depictions are highly over-exaggerated and usually lack any sort of nuanced uh, analysis of Rommel's actions. I've noticed that in your videos, you've understandably tried to avoid talking about the post-war depiction of Rommel too much. But what is your opinion on it and him? Though the romanticization of Rommel, or any Nazi for that matter, is highly dangerous and should be called out, the counter-movement seems to be just as single-minded and unwilling to do any real nuanced analysis. To say that Rommel didn't understand logistics, I think is a bit of a stretch. And the reason why is because, well, he says himself in the middle of his first offensive, it's your pigeon. And he says this to Halder. Halder is, you know, the chief of general staff, I think. Um, and basically he puts Rommel in this position where um, Rommel's in a desert in North Africa He's relying on the Italians supplying him. And the Italians were saying, yeah, yeah, we'll supply a panzer corps in Africa. No problem. And it's like, no, the poor facilities can't sustain it. The only reason I think his first offensive really gets, is able to do what it, it does is partly because of his own skill. He was a good commander, and we'll get to that. But it's also because Churchill brought the British troops out of the North African area and sent them to Greece and replaced them with 2nd Armoured Division that after this first offensive got wiped out and never was uh, seen again because it got uh, disbanded. But the point is that, you know, Rommel gets, gets lucky in that, in that first offensive because the British deliberately weakened themselves uh, and it's mainly Churchill's fault. But... Um, 
yeah, so to say it's logistics, it's not just, it's not, like, Rommel's not bad at logistics. He says, throughout this campaign, we had one eye on the fuel gauge at all times. During Crusader, he's very much aware of what's going on behind him, and I don't think, yeah, he may not be a logistical wizard, but he's not bad at it. Um, and he he was more like, well, logistics is important, but what's more important is leadership from the front, and so on and so forth. So there, I think it's just, it's a low priority for Rommel, um, in terms of what he's thinking in terms of tactical and operational um, aspects. I don't think it's necessarily he's bad at it. And what is interesting is that Rommel and Halder didn't get on. There's like a massive clash and, and Halder goes into a, basically a bit of a rant in his, uh, well, a few rants in his uh, war diaries um, and about Rommel. And he says... Over and over, I don't like Rommel, blah, 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 he's, an, he's a, you know, an idiot or whatever. I can't remember exactly what he says. But basically, if you think about it, like Rommel, Rommel is in North Africa and is annoying Halder because Rommel has Hitler's ear. And Halder is, isn't really getting, seeing eye to eye, you know, he's not getting on with Hitler too well. He gets sacked in 1942 and he messes up 1941. Um, so he doesn't like, Rommel and is trying to pin the blame on Rommel. So it's interesting because who survived the war? Rommel didn't survive the war. Halder did survive the war. And then you've got people like Shira writing The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich who are entirely relying on Halder. Shira even says, I've just gone to Halder and asked him this question and he's told me this. So, you know, he actually says that in the book. So it's like, you know, he, he you've got somebody... History, history is written, people say history is written by the winners. No, history is written by the survivors. Halder survives, he's able to paint Rommel in this bad light. Oh, he was rubbish at logistics. Like, no, you were rubbish at logistics, Halder, but you survived, so you twisted it to say that Rommel was bad at uh, logistics. That is the re that is the thing. So it's like, was Rommel bad at logistics? No, Halder is. <laughs> um, and then you go... Well, that now makes sense because I look at what happened on the Eastern Front. So, yeah, I don't... To say Rommel's bad at logistics, maybe, but not really. I think he understood it. And, you know, it probably wasn't a priority to him in terms of his tactical thinking, but it was a factor and he knew about it and he had one eye on the fuel gauge. He said that. So, absolutely, I don't... And, and think about it. He has no control of the Italian Navy. He has no control. He doesn't even have control of the Italian troops... In, in the field, he's got one or two of the divisions, but the other divisions are not under his command. So he does not have control of the logistics outside of North Africa, especially. So it's rubbish. To say that it's him and he's bad at logistics, it doesn't make any sense. And this idea that Rommel is godlike um, in terms of his, mil you know, his military capabilities, or he he's terrible, because some people think he's the other way around. Um, he's not very good, and, it, and he's been bigged up and whatever else. I think the, the either extreme is pretty bad. I, I, he is a good general. He is a good general. But just like any good general, he has his pros and his cons. There's no general in the war that is perfect in any way, okay? Not even Manstein. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, never mind. Uh, so, the point, the point is that you know, it doesn't matter. He, Rommel can be the greatest general of all time. He'll still make a mistake, okay? Same with General Gavin, all right? General Gavin makes mistakes at Nijmegen, great. Rommel makes mistakes throughout North Africa. And and some people say, yeah, he's a great general and, and point to his good points. And a lot of people say, no, he's bad. Look at his bad points. Um, I think he was a good general. I think he, he wants to leave from the front and that's good. I agree with that. He does it to extreme though. So there's a bad side of it because sometimes you, he wants he needs to be at his HQ because he's the army commander and yet here he is leading a division. It's like what are you doing? Because uh, that's two ranks below you. You shouldn't be doing that. But there he is. And in fact, he's, re he's in Crusader. He's um, leading a reconnaissance patrol. And you're like, what are you doing? Um, so yeah, the, it, it's all you know. I don't think he's as good as some people make him out to be. But I don't think he's as bad as some people make him out to be. But he is a good general, despite his pros and cons. The difference is that he's fighting against the British. And at the beginning you have O'Connor, but he only fights against the Italians. He doesn't fight against Rommel. He comes to the battlefield like two days um, prior to his capture. Uh, at that point it was 
Neem, General Neem in charge. So General Neem is fighting. So O'Connor wipes out the Italians in what is probably the, the greatest victory for Britain in the war, Operation Compass. Then Rommel comes along and smashes Neem. Um, and then O'Connor goes, oh no, and gets to the front. And as he gets to the front, he then gets captured. So he O'Connor does not fight Rommel. So then the best British general that you have is now captured and gone. And after this, you have really poor generals. There are good generals, like there's, um, I forget his name, the guy, um, Moreshead at Tobruk. You have good generals in divisional terms, but you don't have good army or core generals after this point, really. Um, sort of good ones, not great, but the, you know, again, pros and cons, but none of the Rommel League, none of the O'Connor League. The next time you really get that, I mean, Orkinlek's okay, but the next time you really get that, and Wavell's good, um, the next time you really get that is Montgomery. And people, you know, regardless of what you think of Montgomery, what regardless of what you think of Montgomery, when he comes along in 1942, he he changes the the British army. He, he kicks something, you know, and, and get and changes them and stops them from being the sort of silly force that's happening beforehand and actually you know ups the gear in a sense and 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 really transforms the army into something that could actually win the war so that's you know montgomery may not be the greatest general of all time certainly not but and he's definitely got his faults but he is a good general that's that's the difference it's like is he as good as Patton? you know that's a stupid argument but you know, people make that argument. It's like, all right, fine. But Patton's a good general. Montgomery's a good general. Well, which one's better? You know, it doesn't matter if Patton or Montgomery's better. But the fact is, Montgomery is a good general. And you have Rommel, who is a good general, versus Montgomery, who's a good general. And in that specific circumstance, Rommel loses. And it doesn't mean Montgomery is better than him. It just means that Montgomery is capable of beating Rommel in those set of circumstances, blah, blah, blah. But the point is that Montgomery is the first real British general that is actually quite capable and Rommel isn't able to defeat him. So there's that. So I think it's more of a case of Rommel is a good general, but he's facing generals that aren't so good. And when he faces a decent general, when he's at a disadvantage, he loses. So he, cause he's not godlike, you know? So there we go. I, I, th I think it is log logistically, I don't think you can make the claim and as a general, in in general, <laughs> he is good, but he's not amazing and godlike as some make him out to be. But neither is he poor. He's not a poor general either. There's kind of like a middle road to go down there, I think. And Jen's final question. It's always easy to say that the Red Army has such a bad reputation in the West because of Cold War propaganda. But at the same time, most people here seem to be head over heels to fawn over Zhukov. Why has Zhukov managed to escape the propaganda of the Cold War and the Nazi generals intact, when those things have either tainted or straight up erased equally adapt generals like Vatutin, Konyev, Chuikov, Rokossovsky, and Vasilevsky? And what has caused Zhukov to explode in fame in comparison to those people? Zhukov became second in command of the Red Army, or was it the Soviet Union? I forget. He, he basically, he rises to the ranks and becomes second to Stalin. Um, and he took part in most of the big battles of the Second World War, like Stalingrad and uh, Kursk and so on. And he's also, he's also got a memoir written about him. I've got it there. Um, so that's important because if you, of all the ones, all the uh, guys you listed, uh, Vatutin, Konyev, Chirikov and so on, Chirikov aside, most of the others, the Western audience has not even heard of them. Or if they have heard of them, they've heard of, heard of them slightly, like Rokossovsky. Um, there's a book about him. It's like, there's one book. There's not ten, there's one book. So um, Zhukov, I think, has got the advantage in terms of there has been books written about him. And it's probably because, A, he did a memoir. And it also, um, you know, B, he kind of was higher up in the ranks, so he got more attention. I think that's actually the reason why. Zhukov's got his good points and he's got his bad points. And interestingly, of all the guys you mentioned, I would think Zhukov is probably, I wouldn't say the worst commander, but he's got the worst kind of, he's the worst good commander. 
So let me put it this way. So if you want someone, if you really, de- if you, if it's desperate times and you really, really, really need somebody who will just headbutt the enemy over and over again until both sides are exhausted, Zukov is your man. That is actually a good thing in this context. Um, it doesn't sound like it is, but it is. If you want someone who will go, right, I will launch an offensive against the northern sphere, uh, sphere point of the German 6th Army at Stalingrad, uh, in the Kotlaban operation, bang, I'll do that and I'll just keep hammering until eventually both sides are exhausted. And it's interesting because, you know, that, that operation is actually a decisive factor of the Battle of Stalingrad. It's a loss, but it leads to a loss eventually by the 6th Army. So it, it's a, uh, it's, this is quite complicated. But basically, if you want someone who is willing to throw troops into desperate situations because you have no choice, yeah, a lesser commander, somebody who's got, <laughs> um, you know, who kind of feels for his troops a little bit more or whatever, who, who, or who knows that this is a pointless cause, will probably go, oh, it's not for me, this. Well, Zhukov is the kind of guy I go, all right, I'll do it. And just hammer it. And there's a little bit of sort of, oh, that's Western propaganda, blah, 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 to that, because I don't actually have the specifics on a lot of his campaigns. So maybe he's not quite as bad as, as made out there. But certainly in Stalingrad, it is a case of, wow, yeah, you know, and and he, and possibly at Mar- Operation Mars as well, he comes across certainly as a commander who is, I wouldn't say ruthless, but he, he's just, if it's desperate times, it calls for desperate, desperate measures. And w- sometimes you've got to make those hard decisions. Well, if you want someone to make a hard decision, Zukov is your guy. He will do it. So that is actually a good trait of Zukov's. But at the same time, I think Zukov's persona is also the persona that the Western audience has of all Soviet commanders. Well, that's not the case. Chubikov is not the same type of commander as Zukov. Um, Chubikov looks after his men. I'm not saying Zukov doesn't at any point, but it but Chirikov definitely looks after his men, he cares for his men, he tries to come out, you know, with different tactics and so on. Totally different commander to Zukov. Rokossovsky was known, um, and he's the Polish general, sort of, he, he's known for caring about his troops as well. I don't really know much about Konyev, but again, different personality to, um, to Zukov. Vas- Vasilevsky and Vatutin, complete, I mean, Vatut- I think it's Vatutin who is the artillery guy. You know, these guys are completely different tactics. You know, it's like saying Guderian and Ma- Manstein are both, you know, the same general. It's not. They're all different kind of generals and they all have different traits and abilities and blah, blah, blah. So, but our perception in the West especially is this, oh, the Soviets just hammered and hammered and hammered. And that might be the case with Zhukov at Stalingrad and specific other places, but it's not the case in general across the whole of the Eastern Front. And and I think we've got to kind of get that mentality out of our head. But um, I think overall, Zhukov's memoirs and the fact that he was a ha- the highest rank is the, the reason why we've heard about him more than some of the other um, Red Army commanders. Stephen asks, low stress questions, really? And answer if you can at your leisure. Primarily, I'm interested to find out what I can about the very early Middle Eastern campaigns in Iraq, Ethiopia up or two, and including the Karen campaign. If you can recommend reading that, would be appreciated. Like I said, low stress. I love low stress questions, and this one is very low stress. So, here it is. <laughs> All you'll ever need. Um, well, not the specific this book, the whole series, but uh, History of the Second World War, United Kingdom Military Series, the Mediterranean and Middle East, volume, well, volume one, there's all of them, um, but this is by uh, Major General Playfair. This is the official British history book of the Mediterranean and the Middle East. This is this is pretty much the go-to book. Now, if you were doing the North African campaign, I would probably recommend uh, The Crucible of War by Parry, Parry? by Barry Pitt. Um, the annoying part about this is that he doesn't list his sources, although this is one of the major sources. Um, but this is actually a very good series. There's three of these as well. Uh, with Playfair, there's four. But this is the official British history. Um, but if you're not doing the, if you're doing the North African campaign, get this and um, you know the whole series. But if you're not doing the North African campaign, which you're not, you're doing the Middle East and you know they might might be doing um, the East African campaign. This is probably the, the series for yourself. Now, there are, I believe there are a couple of other books out there. 
but I don't know how good they are. But this one should be your starting point um, prior to moving on from there. So I would absolutely 100% recommend this book. George says, Hi Lewis, two questions really. The first is more of a personal question to you. I'm keen to know more about your background. What is it that has drawn you to history and specifically to World War II? It sounds like I'm prying, however. I'm just generally interested to hear your personal story of how you came to this point with your YouTube videos. Have you studied history or is it purely a hobby? It fascinates me to see what has brought people together in the study of history. I've already done a video on why I'm passionate about history and what got me into it, where I've kind of explained most of what you've just asked. So I will link to that again in the, in the description, not the description, the pinned comment below, go and check that video out. But what I will emphasize now is that I do actually have a degree. I was talking to military history visualized at Tankfest and he was surprised to hear that I actually had a degree. He wasn't expecting it. Um, he said, oh, you never mention it. You never mentioned the fact that you've got a degree. Oh, why would I? Um, and this is kind of, I, we kind of got into this kind of conversation, although we didn't finish it, but I am one of them who feels that unless you're going into an academic field, degrees are kind of not relevant. So I don't personally think that you need a degree in history in order to discuss history. And I know some people do think that you do need a degree in history in order to discuss history. But as someone with a degree in history, I can tell you right now, now, I, I will happily debate. Anyone who, yeah, obviously having a degree in history helps. It's obviously an advantage. It shows, hey, this guy clearly knows how to debate and blah, blah, blah. But it, it, it's not essential. So if there's somebody out there who's going, well, I couldn't, I want to do what Tick and Military History Visualize and all these other guys are doing on YouTube, but I don't have a degree. You don't need one. You don't need one. It's not, it's not relevant. I think I, I was going to do a video on this entire topic, actually, uh, about degrees and stuff. Um, and, I, and I'm kind of like, well, actually, now it feels like I'm sort of responding to military visualized in our conversation. But so I don't know if I, I will or not. But the point is that I do feel like degrees don't, they're not necessary unless you're going to work in a museum or whatever, because you might need them then. So yeah, I, I, Maybe my opinion is not quite the the the, the right thing, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just feel like you a degree does not mean you are good at history or that you have all the knowledge. You can have the knowledge without having a degree, okay? So maybe I should do a video on what knowledge you'll need. Um, but I don't know. But yeah, I do actually have a degree. I got two one in history. I never did. People keep asking me, do you, why did you didn't you do a master's or why did you do a PhD or, or whatever? I'm like, why? Is the simple fact I can reach more people in these videos and talk to people, <laughs> yeah, hundreds of thousands of people potentially. Uh, I can reach in these videos. I can't do that in a lecture theatre. It's not worth me getting a PhD or a master's or whatever. And in some ways, I kind of feel like I kind of didn't really need to get a degree. Um, I'm glad I did. It's not something I would turn back time and go, well, I'm definitely not doing that. I'm glad I did it, but it wasn't necessary for me. And maybe in the future it will be, but right now it's, it's not, not even become a factor. George also says, I've mentioned in a comment before, I'm currently planning my dissertation for my masters around the interpretation of Market Garden, more specifically, the Battle of Arnhem. I'm looking at how post-1944 the battle is reflected in literature and memory. I have to remit your reading list on your videos are proving a great help. My main question to you is how did the only major defeat of the Allies post-D-Day not become surrounded in negativity? On the whole, it seems that the memory of Market Garden is remembered in a positive light and visual representation especially highlighted the courageous action of the lower ranks while avoiding top brass politics. As you've discussed before, Beaver and Ryan both discussed the failures of the operation, yet in memory it is often remembered positively rather than as a defeat. Why do you think that is? I think it's kind of like Thermopylae or Alamo or uh, Stalingrad, Pavlov's house, um, Rourke's Drift. I think it's it's to do with that. That's There's something romantic about last stands. 
Um, I just want to point out as well, like, I got into history in general um, because of Close Combat 2, Bridge Too Far, and War Films and so on. So I'm really interested in Market Garden. Um, but there is actually a Close Combat game called you know, the remake of Close Combat 2. It's not really a remake. They've redone the Operation Market Garden. They called it Last Stand Arnhem. So there is really a sort of a, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know what it is. It's like you're cut off behind enemy lines. Got little or no ammunition, but you're gonna hold on and just hold on until you're rescued. It's some sort of romanticism there. And this is why I think a lot of the books on Operation Market Garden concentrate on what happens at, like, Arnhem in general, but also at what happens with Frost, because it is very much this sort of romantic, oh, they're behind enemy lines and, and they've got to try and survive. There's a time limit for how long they, how long can they hold on? You know, if they did this a little bit better, could they last an extra hour um, or a day or two? It's kind of like that with the Battle of Berlin. Um, when I'm reading Battle of Berlin books, I'm like, ooh, what could, the, what could the Germans have done differently to survive that little bit extra? Could they have eked out an extra day? You know, and I don't know what it is. It's, some, it's something to do with that, but... The reason I think it's positive, seen more positively, even though it is a failure, um, is because it is a, a last stand in a sense. I know most, well, not most, a portion of First Airborne did get back to uh, to friendly lines, but it is seen as a last stand. Like, how did they survive? They they went through it all and blah blah blah. And I think there's a positivity there. When you look at Rourke's Drift, it was like I think that's the battle where most of the um, Victoria Cross, they got a ton of Victoria Crosses given out to the people of Rourke's Drift, and it's like, right, but it'll, it, it, it's Sandal, how can you say it? It's Sandal Warner was just around the corner, and you know, you lost your entire army, but a little fort with like 50 guys in it managed to hold out, and yet you give a ton of Victoria Crosses to there, and it's like, it's because it's got that romanticism and sort of this sort of, ooh, they managed to survive against overwhelming odds and they were surrounded and cut off and blah, blah, blah. It's, just, it's to do with that. That's what it is. And that's why I think Arnhem is seen as a positive light um, rather than super negative, like, oh, no, this is terrible. Um, Stalingrad was seen as terrible. But the Germans tried to big it, you know, the propaganda tried to big it up. But it, uh, that's a little bit different because it's 200,000 or 300,000 men nearly. Whereas, you know, Frost at Arnhem is 700 guys. It's a little bit different. So, you know, it's, that's the difference between San Luana and Rourke's Drift. There's a, there's a difference there. So there is that element to it. But yeah, definitely a small group of guys behind enemy lines trying to survive. I think there's a romanticism in it. And that's probably why it's not seen as quite negative as some of the other losses in World War II or whatever have been seen in the past. Robert's also got a couple of questions. I finished reading Alan Brooks' War Diaries a few days ago, and I wonder if there's ever been any thought about making a movie about him, or even a miniseries. Some of the rows between him and Churchill would make for some interesting entertainment. I think Brooke only comes into play, um, certainly in the high command stage, in December of 1941, so he's not really a factor prior to that. He is in France and so on, but he isn't actually, he's not actually with Churchill until December 1941. Well, I've only just reached November of 1941 with Crusader, and that's not out yet. So Brooke is not, has not been a factor yet in the bits that I have studied of the war, um, in terms of, you know, the Battlestorm videos and so on. So that's the reason why I certainly haven't done it. Why have, have films not been made about him in general? I have no idea. But um, I do think, yeah, he's he's interesting. And I am I'm not a Churchill fan. I'll be honest. I, I see Gallipoli. I see what Churchill did in North Africa. I see Churchill as a sort of um, a bit impatient, a, kind of a bit like Stalin in some ways. He's very much about oh, just attack, just attack. Why haven't you attacked? Come on, attack tomorrow. Attack yesterday. It's like. You can't do that. That's not really... And, and a lot of the disasters, especially in North Africa, a lot of the disasters that um, occur are because of Churchill. Like, it's his fault that half of these things go wrong. So I'm not a Churchill fan. So to have somebody who's disagreeing with Churchill and actually um, arguing against him, that's interesting. It's something I do want to look into when I get around to it. But then I think, well, actually, there's a lot of important characters that I also need to do videos on like General Gott or Rommel, <laughs> big one, uh, O'Connor, um, 
uh, Graziani, Gambara maybe, uh, um, Orkinlecht and Wavell, you know, so there are all the, the reason I haven't done is, it, well, there's other reasons why I haven't done it, it's because I, except for Wavell, the others are still ongoing. Um, so yeah, I, I really, I will cover him, but not until I've covered him, I guess, is the, is the way I'm going to look at it. I think that's probably the best way to put it. <laughs> Robert also says, I must admit, I was a bit shocked at Churchill's behaviour when he found out about the Trinity test results and went off about how the Russians will now do as they are told, or Russian cities will be blotted out until they smart it up. I guess my question, aside from a movie about Alan Brooke, concerns Churchill and his attitude about the A-bomb. I've always wondered why the Americans didn't help Britain to develop the bomb, but now I'm thinking Churchill must have had a bit too much to drink one night and called up Truman, demanding the bomb so he could put the Russians in their place. Just kidding, of course. But maybe word did get back to Truman about how Churchill carried on after the test results and decided England's newly elected government might have a similar attitude, so maybe it would be too risky to have them as a nuclear power at the time. Be interesting to hear your opinion about this. I think the reason why... The USA didn't give Britain the bomb. Well, I think there's a few reasons, but one is that, well, they've got the most destructive device in human history. Why would they give it to anyone else? Because they don't know what the British Empire is going to do at this stage. And let's remember the context. We now know that the two superpowers of the Cold War were the United States and uh, the Soviet Union. But in 1945, that wasn't so clear. It looked like there would be a third superpower, and that was going to be Britain. We now know that wasn't the case. But back then it was kind of like, ooh. And Britain did try to go her own way, but was unable to because of the financial situation. So Britain was bankrupt in 1942. Or was it 41? One, one or two. She was bankrupt in the middle of the war. She was entirely reliant on the USA. When... In August 1945, the war ends. America stops, instantly stops, Lend-Lease, which causes massive financial repercussions in Britain. Now, at this time, um, you know, there had been a general election, and Churchill is ousted. So we've got this figure who is the greatest Britain ever, or whatever, people think he is for some reason. But the other guy who had won the war at least he'd won the war he's a great guy in that sense who is taken out nope we don't want you we want somebody else why so this this is this is quite a big topic really but we'll get into it the the, the it all comes back around stick with me so in in prior to the first world war you had poverty in britain you had industrialization poverty blah blah, blah to the point where uh, i've certainly heard this whether it's actually true or not uh, Mothers used to give their children gin because it was cheaper to buy gin than it was bread. That might have been a joke and it's turned into a thing, but I don't know. But th that, you know, the level of poverty prior to the First World War was pretty dire. Uh, certainly before the Boer War, this is why the British um, soldiers in the first in the Boer War were like, you know, uh oh, we can't recruit these guys because they're so sick. <laughs> you know, they're, they're thin, they're frail, whatever, because of the poor um, diet and so on and so forth. World War I happens, the soldiers go off to war, die. Um, but it's like, okay, when they come back, what we'll do is we'll give them homes fit for heroes. This was like a thing that uh, Lloyd George promised, and there's a few others who promised it as well. And we'll give them houses, and we'll give them this, and we'll give them that. And the soldiers came back home, and that really didn't happen. So there was this kind of like, mm, we've been kind of betrayed here. Yeah, the interwar period, which is full of economic problems with the Great Depression and so on and so forth, mass unemployment um, to the point where it's actually like, oh, good, Hitler's come along, we can actually be employed now. Uh, you know, so you've got all this. Well, during the Second World War, the soldiers coming back from the front were like, no, we're not putting up with this again, basically. And at this point, you have a viable alternative to the current way of life, and that was communism. Well, the British soldiers weren't communist, but they were more socialist-leaning, and so were the population at this point. Because, don't forget, you had um, women in the workforce, you had, you know, this great change. The soldiers had 
been through two world wars now where the rich and the poor were both fighting it out together so there's the whole the whole context of the war you've got these soldiers coming back from home who are like no we're not putting up with this anymore and you look at what churchill was offering and you look at what clement attlee and his um party labor party were offering yeah they went they went for labor it's obvious why uh, looking back on it in hindsight it's obvious why they did that and uh great so what happens is you have this massive financial crisis you have um in britain but you have these soldiers coming back from home who are very much a case of right we're not going to war again we've had enough of war we're war weariness we want good lives and we're just after you know good working conditions and so on and so forth so you have clement attlee and his government in power who are very much, I mean, Clement Attlee especially is very much not a warmonger. He actually wants to pull out the Middle East. His government actually tells him, no, we can't do that because we need the oil. So he's not able to pull out fully of the Middle East. He pulls out Palestine, and that's another issue, but he doesn't pull out the Middle East. He pulls out of India and, he, and Pakistan and other areas as well, but he doesn't pull out of the Middle East because of that. He pulls out of Greece um, because of the financial situation, and Britain is in real dire, dire straits, and it's also got to look for its own population. Um, so, in the you know the USA had lent Britain a lot with lend lease, stopped it in 1945, and suddenly Britain has got the biggest debt it's ever been in, ever been in, and it only paid it off in 2006. That's how big this debt was. So Britain's in the biggest debt it's ever been in, but it's got a population that are not willing to put up with, hey, home sit for heroes, you didn't give it us last time, we want it now. So Clement Attlee, I don't know how he does it, and this, this is where you've got to contrast, and this is where history is like really good. You look at the 2008 crisis, and you look at 1945, um, certainly in Britain, and go, what's the difference? 1945, the biggest debt Britain has ever been in, what did you get? You got, and the biggest financial crisis as well, you got pensions, national insurance, workers' rights, industrialized uh, nationalization. You have the nationalization of the Bank of England. <laughs> you have the, the creation of the NHS. The creation of the NHS. Free, universal, at the point of need. All in, in like this, like the first three, four years after the war, in the biggest financial debt the country's ever had. And you contrast that with 2008, and you go, well, clearly some, somebody's not telling us the truth at the minute. Um, and so that's the context. So you have Clement Attlee, who is doing all of this, pulling out of the thing because of the financial crisis, trying to set up NHS and national insurance and blah, blah, blah. And, and nationalizing the industries. He's not a warmonger. He is not Churchill. He's not Churchill at all. So regardless of what Churchill thinks, oh, well, just bomb the, the, the Russians. It's no wonder he got ousted. Like, he, you can't, it's just not, it's not the same. Yeah. And regardless of what Churchill thinks, he's not in power anymore. So the USA, if anything, the USA, if they were going to give a bomb to a country, they may as well give it to Britain because why not? They've got a guy who's clearly not going to war with the Russians at any time soon in Clement Attlee. Uh, so it's not about Britain and sort of Churchill's chest pounding. It's nothing to do with that. It's only really about, well, why should we give Britain the bomb? What what incentive do we have to give Britain the bomb? And there isn't any. There is none. Um, why would you give another power a nuclear device? You just you just don't do that. Now Britain did invent the uh, invent. Britain did develop the bomb. They got it in 1952. Uh, although Clement Attlee started the process of developing the bomb, and that actually split his government in two. So there's that issue as well. But he he started the process of getting the bomb because everyone else was. The Russians got it in 47. I think um, somebody's going to correct me on that. But yeah, it, it, it's not about what I like to say. Why would America give, at this point especially, they're not allies, really. They are allies, but they're not. Britain tries to go its own way. It tries, and this is the thing with Clement Attlee, trying to balance out the Soviet Union and the United States and, and become this third superpower. But with the financial crisis on the, on the way, and 
um, the dis you know the the dissolution of the empire, the decolonization, all this problem at home. Got to try and settle these industries and blah blah blah, and the and the financial situation. Britain really sinks. It's not able. It's not a superpower. And I mean, this only really comes into play later. But the 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 crisis, the cracks are, are definitely there. It's it's on its way down. And it's mainly because of the financial crisis. Because of the financial crisis, Britain has no choice. It can't really ally with the Soviets. So they go to the um, the West. They go and ally with the United States because they need to. And they get Marshall Plan and blah, blah, blah. So, so that is the reason why. And yeah, they could have traded uh, the bomb for something. But what has Britain got to offer in 1945, 46, 47? Nothing. So there's that. I think I think that's the reason why. I don't think it's to do with Churchill. I don't think it's to do with, um, you know, anything like that. I just think it is literally just the financial situation Britain is in, and the fact that why why would you give them the bomb? It doesn't like there's no reason to do that. So I hope that answers your question. So that's all of the questions. What I'm going to do is do another one of these next month. So if you are Wanting to ask me a question that you would like answering in the video, please consider supporting me on Patreon. $5 or more will allow you to ask questions which I'll answer directly in the video. So thank you to my patrons. Thank you to everyone who asked the questions. And if you've got more, don't, don't hesitate. I'll answer them next month. I might do separate videos. I'll see how we get on. So hope you've enjoyed the video. Thank you to my patrons for supporting. You guys are actually making this channel possible. So it is, you know, you guys are awesome, really are. And I will do more videos like this in the future because you deserve it, you absolutely do. Um, so yeah, thank you very much everyone. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for supporting, bye for now.